Let's take our Bibles tonight. Go with me to Matthew chapter 25. After tonight, we have only, I thought we had two messages left. We only have one more message in this series. Next Wednesday night will be the last. Uh, the following Wednesday night, we're going to be in Texas. Uh, so Brother Justin Murphy is going to be preaching, and I hope that you will be here in force and uh, support him and encourage him. I know he would appreciate that, but uh, we're going to be in Texas for that week, just enjoying Christmas with Hannah. Uh, so we've got one more message. I can't believe it. Seems like we've been here forever, and now it's coming to a close. So tonight we are starting off, I left question 126 last week, hanging and incomplete. So the passage comes out of Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. The Bible says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall, he ga shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and He shall set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on His right hand, Come, ye blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me, and I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Question 126, if you weren't here last week, was this. Who are the least that Jesus is speaking about? Who are the least of these my brethren that Jesus is speaking about? Talking with the individual who asked this question, uh, I found out a little bit more about the question and where it comes from, and it comes from the way that this passage of Scripture is misused. One of the ways in which this passage of Scripture is misused is by any humanitarian philanthropic group that is around, and they will say that we need to reach out to the poor and the hungry and all this kind of stuff. We need to have our soup suppers, our, our, our homeless shelters, and all that kind of stuff because of this passage right here. Because the Lord says, as much as you've done it to the one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And that will be the biblical justification for doing it. Another one of the misuses, and this one really surprised me, but there are churches in our area that will use this very passage of Scripture, believe it or not, to be anti-Israel and pro-Palestinian. I don't know how they twist that to say that, but they will say that the Palestinian is the least of these, my brethren, and therefore uh, this is why we ought to be reaching out to them and all these kinds of things. Both applications of these verses are gross misuses and misinterpretations of these verses. From last week, let me give you some reminders as well as giving greater explanations on some of the things we talked about. First of all, the timing of this. The timing of Matthew chapter 25 is at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. So we have the rapture, we have the seven-year tribulation period, and then we have the judgment of the nations when Jesus Christ has come back. The Bible says He sits upon the seat of the throne of His glory. At that time, we have the judgment of the nations. So this is prior to the entrance into the millennial kingdom, and it involves all the people that are alive that have survived through the tribulation period. In Bible days... Sheep and goats oftentimes were, were um, brought together. They were herded together. And the Lord says He is going to separate those. And I said last week, we know what goat stands for in our culture, greatest of all time. That is not what a goat was in the Bible days. The goat represented those that had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They had rejected um, His people and, and salvation, the whole, whole thing. And the Bible says that they will be separated, verses 41 through 46. Verse 46 says they shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The righteous are those who are, considered, are, are, are called the sheep. Here's something that I didn't bring out as clearly as I should have last week. The least of these, my brethren, isn't just talking about the needy. 
the needy being described as the hungry, the impoverished, the imprisoned, the thirsty, the sick, the naked. The Bible says, the least of these are my brethren. So the least of these is talking about those who are believers, those who had been saved during the tribulation period. When you understand prophecy and the context that this is written in, the bulk of prophecy does not revolve around Gentiles, it revolves around Jews. And when you see this throughout prophecy, you recognize that so many people that are going to be saved during the tribulation period are going to be Jewish people. So this isn't just referring to believers. I think the bulk of the reference is to Jewish believers. The least of these, my brethren. If we think that the persecuted church is suffering today, can you imagine what it's going to be like during the tribulation period? Back up to chapter 24. If you think the Jews have it bad now, take a look at what's going to happen during the tribulation period. The Bible says, starting in verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. The abomination of desolation takes place at the three and a half year period mark. Seven years tribulation period, the midpoint, three and a half years, this abomination of desolation takes place. Verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Who's this written to? Jews. It is written to the place where the events of prophecy are really going to unfold. It is written to the place where when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, His feet touch down at the Mount of Olives. It is written to this region. Now, is the tribulation effects going to be global? Yes. But when you look at the Lord's attention about prophecy, you don't read about His attention being in the Western Hemisphere. You read about the events that are going to take place in the Middle East. You read about the events that are going to take place through some of the European nations and Asian nations that are going to come across and the battles that these or the battle that these nations are going to bring against Israel. It has nothing to do with us over here. It has everything to do with the events taking place over there. So as you look at this, the bulk of the interpretation of when the Lord says, the least of these, my brethren, is taking care of those Jewish believers during the tribulation period. Now, how does any of this apply to the church today? Or does it? Can we make application? Certainly we can make application, so long as we understand what the interpretation is of the passage. The application can go like this. First of all, God has always wanted us to show concern for the poor because of his concern for the poor. Go back to the book of Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. God has always wanted us to have a tender heart towards those who are the poor and the needy. In Proverbs chapter, or excuse me, Psalm chapter 12 verse 5. Psalm chapter 12 verse 5. Notice what the Lord says here. In Psalm 12, verse 5, the Bible says, For the oppression of the poor, for the sign of the needy, now will I arise, saith the Lord. I will set him in safety from him that puffeth at him. So God is concerned not only about the oppression of the poor and the sign of the needy, but against those who have acted out against them. Go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs chapter 22. In Proverbs 22, verse 22, the Lord says this, Rob not the poor, because he is poor. Neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them. So it's obvious that God has an interest, He has a care and a concern for those who are the poor. In the Gospels, the Lord said, we are going to have the poor with us always. 
So it shouldn't come as any surprise that we do. And there's absolutely nothing that can be done to alleviate it and make it go away. We are going to have the poor with us always. According to the Census Bureau, there are plenty of people in our world who are considered poor. In America, Americans make up less than 5% of the world's population while earning more than 20% of the world's total income. Despite that, 1 in 10 Americans live in poverty. The definition in 2021, a family of four is considered impoverished by the government if the household income was at or below 26500 In contrast, the median household income for a family of the same size was 90657 That was in 2021. So we're always going to have those who are the poor with us. The second thing is this. Our issue comes about when trying to define the poor. Our issue comes about when trying to define the poor. There could be many classifications for those who are poor. We could put some of those who are poor, we could call them the working class poor. They are individuals who are working multiple jobs, husband and wife, maybe the jobs don't pay a whole lot. Uh, You look at the economy, prices are going up a whole lot faster than the income is going up, right? Right? Uh, If you don't believe that, obviously you haven't been to a grocery store lately. That's depressing. That is absolutely depressing to go into a grocery store and see what the prices are. You can't buy anything, hardly, that hasn't gone up. So we've got the working class poor, those individuals who are working multiple jobs, and yet the income is still low. We have those who have become poor through things that they had no control of. For instance, medical bills cost of medical bills has shot through the roof. Um, This whole Obamacare or the ACA, it's been kind of interesting to hear people speaking out saying how terrible it is. Huh. I think there was a lot of common sense people that said it was terrible before it ever got started. But anyhow, who listens to us, right? Well, you look at where medical costs are at. Some people, you go to the doctor, you can go medically poor very quickly. If you've got to go get a prescription filled, Yikes. I don't know how some people afford those things. Every once in a while, you know, they'll come up with a commercial for this new drug that's out. And we use GoodRx, and, and there's another one called, I think it's called CleverRx. So I'll put in the drug price. I'm just curious. Wow. I mean, for a, a, a month's supply, $10,000? Now, you tell me who can afford that. It's like, no, thank you. Just let me die. You know, who can afford that? It's crazy. I tell you what, these pharmaceutical companies that are doing this kind of stuff, God's going to judge these people. That is wrong. That is absolutely wrong to have those kind of prices on medications. Some people are poor from that. Other people have experienced layoffs. Nothing you can do about that. Hasbro. It's, all, it's, it's coming into Christmas when everybody buys toys, right? They just laid off over a thousand workers and more to come. Wow. Merry Christmas. Here's your bonus. It's a pink slip. Out the door you go. Terrible. In spite of all of Dave Ramsey's pontifications, a thousand dollar emergency fund don't go far these days, does it? There are the persecuted poor, believers that are in places not so much in the United States of America, but in other places of the world that are poor because of the persecution they've experienced for Jesus Christ. And then there's the lazy poor. Those are the people who could work, but won't work. There's a big difference. They can. They have the ability. They have the physical strength and all that kind of stuff. They just won't. They won't do it. Uh, These are the ones that really cause us some heartburn. You know, they're, and you know, we have have become jaded. We have become skeptical because everywhere you go, here's somebody with their sign, and you just kind of watch. Where do they go at the end of the day? You say, well, why wouldn't they get a job? You know, there's jobs posted out there. They could get a job, all this kind of stuff. Very simple. 
And if they're honest, they'd tell you. They get all their money tax-free. Don't have to pay an ounce of tax on it. Don't have to claim it. They just take your generosity and run away with it. And that has made us jaded. It has made us cold-hearted towards those who have needs that we say, well, I don't even want to hear it. And we turn a deaf ear to it. Christians, we have to be very, very careful with that because there are those in our world truly needy. There are some that are just super cold and they're just an instant no, and there's other people that, you know, it's like, oh, they've got their sign, i got to give them something. Stop that. Stop that. Come in the middle. Pray for God's discernment. Oh, I, the Lord told me. The Lord didn't tell you every time you see a sign to start forking over money. Now, come on. But some people do that. We need to be sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit of God and that it's really the Holy Spirit of God. There's a lot of people. I, I just talking to Brother Gavino on Sunday. People will say, well, God led me. God told me. God called me. Honestly, I start getting a little, I start hearing those words and my defenses come up instantly because it's like, hmm, you sure it was God or are you just having an emotional fickle tickle moment? Because if it was God, then you're going to continue and you're going to persevere and you're going to go through the trials and the struggles and everything else and you're, gonna, you're not going to quit. But so many people say, God called me and problems arise and they quit. Now wait a minute. Did God know you were going to have problems ahead of time? Yeah. So you mean he called you in spite of knowing you'd have problems yeah then why'd you quit well you just don't understand i'll come all the excuses like mm. i don't know i i really do i start getting very um i don't know very skeptical with those words because they can be thrown out way too easily uh when somebody gets emotional about something nothing wrong with getting emotional but anyhow that's another sermon. Here's the third thing. Here's the third thing. We have the greatest responsibility towards the poor of the house of God. We have the greatest responsibility towards the poor of the house of God. Let's go to Romans 15, verse 26. Romans 15, verse 26. In Romans 15 and verse 26, the Bible says here, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Poor saints at Jerusalem. Why were they poor saints? Because they have been persecuted. This is a church, these are Christians that are needy because their walk with the Lord has put them in the poverty status. You say, how? Well, because they've lost jobs, they're ostracized from society, they're not able to purchase in the marketplace and, and, and go different places because now they claim the name of Jesus. And that's, that's made them a target. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. The first four verses says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Galatians chapter 6, two other places where the Bible tells us that we are supposed to reach out to those who are needy. The Bible says we are supposed to do good. Galatians 6.10 says we are to do good to all men, but especially for those of the household of God. That's where our, our, our passion's got to be, folks. We have got to consider those who are needy among the brethren. When we see brothers and sisters in Christ legitimately hurting, 
we got to be quick to be there to rush in and help. Uh, the book of James talks about that. Talks about us if we see a brother be needy and everything, we just say, kind of go your way and you know, have a great day and all that kind of stuff. What kind of, what kind of working out our faith is that? It's the wrong kind. So, as I said, we've got to be sensitive to that. So that finishes up question 126. Here's a new one. Question 127. Uh, three sentences, so whittle it down however you want. What are the dispensations in the Bible? I've heard different ways of dividing the Bible in, up into dispensations. Which way is correct? What are the dispensations? I've heard many ways to do it. Which way is correct? That is a huge question. We're going to try to simplify this a little bit. Let's first of all go to the book of Ephesians. Only four times in the Bible, two of them here in the book of Ephesians, do we see the word dispensation. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says here that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Jump over to chapter 3 and verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. So there's two of the four times we see that word. What does the word mean? The word dispensation simply means management, oversight, or administration. A dispensation is a way to order various events and a way to interpret history. In theology, a dispensation is the divine administration of a period of time. Each dispensation, a divinely appointed age. Dispensationalism, big word. Uh, all that is is just a theological system that recognizes that God ordained these different time periods, if you will. The distinctives of dispensationalism are twofold. If you find an individual that is a dispensationalist, and we are, whether we realize it or not, you say, well, how do you know that a person is a dispensationalist? Number one, they will interpret the Bible literally, historically, and that includes the interpretation of prophecy. Those who will interpret the Bible literally and historically, including prophecy, are going to see God's way of working at different times with different groups of people in different ways. The second thing is that those who are dispensationalists will view Israel and the church as two separate entities, not as the same. The church did not replace Israel. That is a, 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 a theology called replacement theology. The church did not replace Israel. Israel has not been replaced by us. Israel still has their unique place that is going to unfold in God's plan and program. So Israel, the church, two different things. Those who are dispensationalists will have those two characteristics in common. Typically, when you study this out, you're going to find seven dispensations uh, that the theologians have created based upon the Scripture. First of all, you might want to jot these down, just one word things. First of all, the dispensation of innocence. The dispensation of innocence goes from Genesis 1-1 to chapter 3, verse 7. This is between the creation and the fall of man in the garden. It should be very obvious that God was able to work with man in a very unique and special way, different than any other time in, in history in that little segment of Scripture. The next is the dispensation of conscience. That is between the fall and the flood. God allowed man's conscience, if you will, to govern his behavior without divine interference. When God does choose to interfere, that's where you go. The Bible says that it repented God that he made man, and he came up with the plan. He already had the plan, not that he came up with it. He introduced the plan that he was going to destroy the world with the flood. That takes us to the third thing, human government. And that goes from the flood to Abraham, Genesis 9 through 11 and verse 32. After human government came the dispensation of promise. The dispensation of promises from Abraham to Moses. God promised Abraham a homeland. 
He promised him a son. He promised him many descendants that were going to come in a great nation. From Exodus 20 until the end of the Gospel of John, we have the law. You say, well, how does the law go into the Gospels? Because the law required not only the, for it to come to completion, not only the death and the burial of Jesus Christ, but also resurrection. Because if Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, our faith is in vain. So we've got to go all the way through until that time period. From there, we have the dispensation of grace from Acts until chapter 20, verse 3 of the Revelation, and then we have the millennial kingdom. These dispensations have absolutely nothing to do with salvation. Salvation, God's plan of salvation has always been the same regardless of the dispensation. It always revolves around Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah for those in the Old Testament, for those of us today, the Messiah who has come. We always look back to Jesus. Uh, part of the question was, why are there different ways to get the different numbers of dispensations? Some have said there are three, some say nine, some take the number clear up in the 30s. You say, how in the world do people get so many different numbers of dispensations? Even if you are interpreting the Bible literally and historically, it's often just a matter of maybe how you've divided up some when they come up with 30-some, they have taken the, the seven and divided them into subcategories. Um, I don't know why that's necessary. I don't know that it matters, but they will go into the subcategories. Uh, those that will interpret the Bible from an allegorical standpoint rather than a, a literal standpoint, they will come up with a different number. We know that to interpret the Bible from an allegorical standpoint, that's wrong. You interpret God's Word literally just like He said it, you accept it. You take God's, God at His word for what He has said. Dake's annotated Bible comes up with nine. Now, first of all, throw out a big warning here. Dake is a, well, he's deceased now, but he's Pentecostal. So there's a lot of Pentecostalism, charismatic stuff all throughout his Bible. The Dake's annotated Bible is loaded with notes. Uh, he comes up with nine dispensations. The reason he comes up with nine, though, is because he comes up with two dispensations that involve the angels. Okay, is that wrong? Is that bad? Not really, but when we're talking about the dispensations, we're talking about God and man, not God and angels. So he throws angels into the works and brings in a, a third category. Uh, everything that I found from all the conservative, fundamental, evangelical uh, Bible commentators, all of them come up with seven dispensations, the seven that I gave you. Most of the time they will use those terms. Um, sometimes the term may be a little bit different, but it's still saying the same thing. So that's it on dispensationalism. The last question tonight, it's a really uh, interesting, good practical question. I've thought about this question before myself. Thankfully, haven't had to try to figure out what to do with it. Question 128. If somebody is unable to be baptized in the baptistry due to health reasons, is there another way to anoint them so that they can still be obedient unto baptism? Now that's something to think about. If somebody is unable to get in the baptistry, what do we do? I've thought that one through before and wondered what would we do. Um, I want to give you three things tonight as I've thought that one through. Some points that you already know, but just to set up the answer. The first thing is this. Scripturally, baptism is only by immersion. You see absolutely nothing else in Scripture that allows for any other method of baptism but total immersion. Go with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 36 through 39. And whenever you see baptism in the Bible, you see the, the, almost the exact same picture. In Acts 8, 36, the Bible says, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. 
And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. When we see how baptism is performed in Scripture, it is always by immersion. The meaning of the word, baptize, deals with immersion. There is absolutely nothing else. The examples found in Scripture, the symbolism. Romans chapter 6, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, raised to walk in newness of life. The symbolism is all about full and complete immersion. Nothing else is found in Scripture as a different or acceptable mode to baptize somebody. So that's off the table right there. So if somebody says, well, could I do something different and that be counted as baptism? No, because it wouldn't be baptism. Here's the second thing. Baptism, and we know this, baptism is not necessary for salvation. Baptism is not necessary for salvation. Go back to Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 39. Luke 23, 39. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The unbaptized saint is just as much a saint as the baptized saint. Because becoming a saint has absolutely nothing to do with getting soaked. It has to do with getting saved. This gentleman on the cross, this thief on the cross, was he as saved as any of us that are saved tonight? But he wasn't baptized. Now those people that are baptismal regeneration, regenerous, generationless, whatever, They say you got to be baptized. They will say, well, this was before Christ had risen from the grave, so therefore it's not necessary. Huh. How did Jesus begin his earthly ministry? He was baptized. So you can't use that as an argument. Baptism has been around. This guy wasn't baptized. Why didn't Jesus? And Jesus could have gotten him off the cross as well as himself to get him baptized. So why didn't he do that? Because what was important is that the man was saved, and this day would be in paradise. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says that the Lord didn't send him to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Romans chapter 1 says that it is the gospel that saves a person. So baptism doesn't save the individual. Baptism has nothing to do Uh, with the gospel message. The only liquid in the gospel message is the blood of Jesus. And that's it. Not baptismal waters at all. Number three, you say, well, then why should we worry about getting baptized? Because baptism is an act of obedience that makes an outward statement of what's already transpired internally. In the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, go therefore into all nations teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are to be baptized out of obedience and out of an outward profession to the world of what's already taken place on the inside. It is something that we do because we've been told to do it. It's an ordinance. So is the person, now think this through carefully, is the person who can't be baptized, and I mean legitimately could not, they've got some sort of a medical reason, they're sitting on death row, Can a death row person get saved? Yes, they can, just in case you're questioning. Yes, they can. They're sitting on death row. They're hanging on a cross. I mean, that guy was on death row. Can they, excuse me, are they being disobedient if they cannot be baptized? No. It is the, the statement of their heart, and God knows the heart. 
The person who can be baptized and won't be baptized is a disobedient Christian. If you're sitting here tonight and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and you have never followed the Lord and believers' baptism, and as I look across the auditorium tonight, I see healthy people. So if you are saved and you have rejected being baptized for whatever reason, you're in sin. Plain and simple. You should be baptized if you're really saved. But the person that cannot physically, for some medical reason, or another situation that legitimately cannot be baptized, are they still going to go to heaven? Yes. Are they being disobedient? No. Not when you can't. We're talking about the person that won't. Now, that being said, I would definitely encourage somebody who thinks they can't to explore all possibilities of how they could. Because you look at the baptistry and you say, well, I can think of several situations of somebody that can't get into the baptistry. I agree. But we can get you in a pond. Not in December. Not in December. But when the weather's nice, things have warmed up, we can get you in a pond. That's a whole lot easier to walk down a gentle bank, walk into the water, baptize you there, walk in and say, well, they're in a wheelchair. I saw one of the coolest things on Instagram. I loved it. And I thought, this is awesome. A gentleman who was an invalid, they put him on a backboard, like what the fire department, the hospital uses. They put him on a, a rigid backboard and they strapped him all up on that backboard. And about eight men took this man, took the backboard and all, and they walked out together into the pond. The preacher said his thing that they always do, and eight men took him down and brought him back up. And I, I'm inside of me, I'm shouting hallelujah, amen. I'm thinking that is so stinking cool for them to have done that, for him to have wanted to be baptized, so much so that he would say, you know, it's kind of like the guy that got let down through the roof. Well, we're going to let you down into the water. We're going to carry you out there. You see, there are ways that a lot of times when somebody thinks it can't be done, that it could be done. We just have to be a little creative and, and think it through. We'll come up with a plan somehow. The good thing is the occasion that a person legitimately can't, physically can't, person on their deathbed, maybe they're dying of, of some horrid disease or, or whatever, and I mean, they've got days to live, and, and they're in a hospice unit or something like that. Can they get saved if they're not saved? Absolutely. What are the chances that they're going to be able to be baptized? Probably not real good. Are they going to be at a lesser place in heaven? No, not at all. I'm just saying, though, if we are ever faced with a situation, and we're scratching our heads saying, I don't think we can do this. We just have to give it some thinking. At the why. I was told that at the why, you know, all the elderly folks got to go for their physical therapy in the water. They've got like a Hoyer lift. The why will let you rent out their pool. We'll get the person in the Hoyer lift. Zzzz, zzzz. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we hope it doesn't fail uh, we'll test it a couple of times and just okay it's working here we go there are ways it could be done and you know to be honest with you i think the challenge of it is a thrill for somebody to want so much to follow the lord and believers baptism and they know it's going to be difficult to come up with a plan but it's like, can we do it? I want to do it. We'll figure something out. Trust us. We'll come up with something. Isn't that cool? I just, I just think that would be so neat to take somebody out to a pond. We don't need this baptistry back here. Do I like it? Absolutely. I love heated water. 97 degrees. That's, that's why I'm saying we ain't baptizing in December unless we go to the Y. 
Tonight, these questions are good. These are practical questions, things that we can think through, wrestle with a little bit. As I said tonight, I look at a, essentially a healthy church. If you know Christ as Savior, have you followed the Lord and believers' baptism? And if not, why not? What's the holdup? So, oh, I, I was baptized as a baby. No, you weren't. That was not baptism. And by the way, baptism always comes after salvation, never before. If it came before, then what was it a testimony of? The testimony of nothing it comes after you've been saved. So I hope that if you're in that category, that you would say, you know what? I want to be obedient to the Lord. I want to be obedient. Maybe you're here tonight, you don't know Christ as Savior. Well, I don't want to get baptized. We don't want you to get baptized. We want you to get saved. You can go through a baptistry a hundred times. You can go out the Jordan River. Some people, oh, God gets... Want to go out to Israel and get baptized in the Jordan? I'm thinking, why? Why? Well, Jesus was. Yeah, you got baptized once as a believer, right? Yeah, but I want to do it the way Jesus did. Okay. I don't understand that, but if that makes you feel good, okay. But it didn't get you saved. It just put you in a bunch of dirty water out there. you got to be saved by the blood of Christ and the power of His resurrection. Lost person, that's the only way. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed tonight. I don't know who's saved or lost. That's impossible for me to know. But God knows. And if you're here tonight, you've never trusted the Lord to save you, and say, I want to do that tonight. Then would you be willing to pray something like this? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I know I am. And I've never accepted you as my Savior. I've been trying all sorts of different things to get saved and get right with you. But tonight, Lord, I believe you love me. You love me so much that you died on a cross for me. You shed your blood in payment of my sins. You were buried in the tomb and you arose again from the grave. And tonight, Lord, I ask you to come into my heart and save me. Forgive me, Lord. Be my Savior. Have you prayed anything like that tonight? It has to be your words. It has to be from your heart. But have you prayed anything like that tonight? If you did, you just slip your hand up. And our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the questions that have been asked and, and just the privilege that we have to be able to search the Scriptures and find the truth and to know what you have for us. Tonight, if there's still one without you as Savior, we pray that even tonight they give their heart and life to you. We pray and ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.